All right, welcome everyone. My name is Denise Goss. I work at FIRST. I have CIE ichthyosis and I live in New Orleans. It is my great pleasure to introduce you all tonight, reintroduce a familiar face, Rachel C. Uh, we are so happy to have you with us tonight, Rachel. Um, Denise. Rachel is joining us. Um, she has been on our board. She was on the board of FIRST from 2009 to 2017. Rachel is one of the most courageous people I have ever met in my entire life. Um, she has surprised me with um, more than, on more than one occasion. Um, she is a brilliant, brilliant person. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to her in just a couple of minutes. Um, if you've got questions during tonight's um, talk, feel free to drop them in the, uh, the Facebook comments um, and we will do our best to address those at the end. Um, and uh, Rachel is going to, to take us through some, some of what she knows best about. Um, Rachel is an affected adult. She has ichthyosis in confetti. She has four children. Three of them are affected. Um, which is uh, um, quite a feat in and of itself. But in addition to that, um, Rachel is also the board chair for the National Center for Transgender Equality. And right now she is the special assistant to the chair of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And she's also practically a professional French horn player. So uh, if that's not enough, um, she's also willing to take uh, take some time tonight to talk to us about disability and discrimination and what that means for those of us with ichthyosis. Uh, that's her area of specialty. And um, she's going to talk to us um, from, from her perspective, what that has been for her firsthand, and then also what she knows of that um, from her own experience, um, kind of from a, a legal, not, not official legal advice, um, but uh, I'm just so excited to have you with us, Rachel. So uh, welcome, Rachel, and uh, the floor is all yours. So again, um, questions and comments, we'll try to keep up as best we can um, uh, during, the, during the talk, but we'll address them all at the end. Sure, thanks, Denise. Uh, I am really delighted to be here with my ichthyosis family. And uh, I, I think that one thing that first has taught me or, or that I'm experienced in my, gosh, it's, it's, you know, not just my time on the board, but my time attending the conferences and interacting with folks online um, is that, you know, we are a family. And, and like, you know, like family, we can annoy the heck out of each other sometimes and have our little spiffs and spats. Um, but we, we do have these really close ties uh, together and I am absolutely delighted to uh, sit down virtually with family and, and talk. Um, I hope I'm not just going to monologue for an hour, although I, I suspect uh, I probably could. Uh, we, I have an outline here and if I if I start you know, wandering or you know Denise looks you know in horror at what I start saying, uh, I'll move on. Uh, I'm really quite happy to take questions uh, at the end, so, so please uh, go ahead and submit those uh, via the chat there. So uh, I don't like talking about my skin. Throughout, throughout most of my life, I have, I have not enjoyed it. Um, you know, as as a, a very shy kid and a, as a teenager, I, I you know I, I sat you know with my hands you know underneath um, my my arms, you sort of hunched hunched over. Not and you know I, I just didn't like talking about my skin, and I I think that as an adult, the way that I have grown and grown in comfort with myself and in my own body and, and with who I am, um, that, that my thinking about talking about my disability, talking about my skin, uh, identifying myself as a person with a disability uh, has changed. So I'm gonna take you through my employment history and my horrible experiences in the workplace and, and how now life is different for me. So, uh, you know, 
gosh, I've been practicing law for 20 years and and saying that out loud is is kind of scary to me, actually. I started out uh, as a lawyer at a large law firm. And with respect and love to my friends who might be at law firms or might have family or you know experience with law firms, they're really horrible places to work to start your career at. They, you know, that you you go in there and you say, "Hi, I'm a lawyer with a disability. I have a disability." That's not. That wasn't how I did it. <laughs> um, I didn't tell anyone at my firm. Uh, I hid the fact that I happened to have all of this stuff going on. Uh, you know, look, I, I worked. You know, I, I worked long nights and weekends and spent way too much time uh, in the office. Uh, you know, I build 2300, 2400 hours one year. I, I never want to do that again. Um, I kept a whole bunch of things in my desk drawers uh, at, at work. And when I needed to do my skincare routine or, you know, do stuff and, and I'll talk, I'll do show and tell. I have like my show and tell all, you know, laid out here off camera and we will do that later. But I, I hit it. Uh, I, I hit it um, from from people, you know, in the firm. And it, it wasn't something I was comfortable talking about as like the really, really. OK, so. 20 years ago, the practice of law was a little different. <laughs> and as you know, the really, really junior lawyer, um, you know, I was the one, you know, who, who literally had to, you know, a few times run to the courthouse to make a filing deadline. And that was when you had to file some things in state court, you know, in paper and, you know, get, get, get the stamp on there. And, you know, that, that sprint in dress shoes, uh, you know, in the snow, uh, you know, to the courthouse is like <laughs> that. Okay, well, we should have had a courier. We we should have had a courier on the ready, but you know that, and that's a long story why it had to be the associate at many hundred dollars an hour, running to the courthouse to file things. But you know that that wasn't a good, that wasn't a good thing for me, especially in the winter. And you know, winter, I was my first job was in in Columbus, Ohio, um, and and the winters, you know, the icy, snowy ick over there were were really bad on my feet, uh, you know, bad, bad on, on my hands. Um, six years at that firm, I, I moved to a firm in Chicago, Illinois, uh, you know, in the loop. Um, and my, my, you know, I had, I, I didn't really say anything, you know, to, you know, uh, to my boss, to the people who hired me in Chicago, even though it was an employment law firm, it was you know a management side employment law firm, and and I didn't say anything about my skin, and you know that that was, you know, now you know me many years later, I, I think that was a mistake. Uh, I, I think that was you know be something that I would want to sort of you know, slap you know me from 14 years ago in the face and you know say why what you know what what did you think you were hiding or accomplishing or what do you think the consequences of spinning you know of of having this come up by surprise would be <laughs> um but you know that was that was me and and that was that was how i was and you know, I had these, you know, really weird interactions. So, you know, like like lawyers at law firms, I shared a secretary with with several other lawyers, and my secretary in Chicago. Oh, it's it's you know, it's like nine minutes. I'm getting the happy fun slander already. My my secretary um, in, in Chicago was not the friendliest of people. Um, I, I think by being really unfriendly to the associates, she she probably figured out that she could avoid doing work by being really unfriendly to people. Um, and, and so, you know, I have this person outside, sitting outside my office, who's theoretically supposed to help me with things. And, you, you know, asking your secretary, hey, could you help me open this? <laughs> you know, I have, I have this package and you, you, you sliced it open and you logged it, but could you help me open it? That came across the wrong way because it's not, hi, I have 
some problems with my hands and I don't, I really can't open this by myself. Can you help me? No, it, it, it turned into the, this, oh, I'm being asked to do something that I shouldn't be asked to do. And, and that it was, it was, it was a bit of a mess. It, that, that was a bit of a mess. And, you know, really, I just needed some help opening packages and I, I could have had a much different um, discussion had, uh, had I had different attitudes about and, and a different level of confidence that I that I didn't have back uh, in 2006 or 2007. Uh, I'd, I'd like to think too that so much of it was was part of the the just the culture spirit of the times and there's there's a different level of of just universal awareness now because I I certainly hear so much and there's there's folks commenting too that saying, yes, 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 I did the same thing. And it's like, who are we hiding this from? And number one, like parentheses, like how effectively are we even hiding it? Because like, like when your hands are different and you have to shake people's hands, you know, maybe the whole room is pretending like your hands are the same, but it's. Yeah, or, or there's 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 an awareness. Okay, I just shook her hand, and there's something different here, and I know better than to ask or make a big right, deal. Right, right. But and on the, the other hand, yeah, don't notice. And who are you really? <laughs> it's right. And so maybe maybe more and more uh, affected adults can can decide that we're just not going to do this anymore, and it doesn't serve us. Because I heard Abby Evans talking. Uh, and she's she's much younger than we are. <clears throat> uh, and uh, she said in, in her second job, you know, she she came in and on the first day she was like, hi, here are my lotions. Where's the fridge? <laughs> At, I don't know, age 22 or something. And, uh, you know, maybe we we have decided that that it's enough. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. You know, I I, I think that you know, part of part of it is the culture, and you know, frankly, the law firms you know that I started at, it, it was it was pretty intimidating for me straight out of law school. And you know, Denise, you, you'll laugh thinking you know, Ra you know, Rachel being intimidated by by someone, and it's like, hey, you know, I've I've grown a lot. <laughs> uh, I've I've grown a lot, you know, since then. And, and you know, look at in two thousand and six, that was that was one of the preeminent management side employment labor and employment law firms that I was working at. So you know, they they do understand. You know, they they would have you know eaten up the uh, th a lot of things. They uh, you know they would I think they would be have been pleased to say, hey, we've inadvertently hired yet a, a, a lawyer with a disability, you know, check off that box, check off that, that extra box. And I didn't let him check off that box. Um, so one of the, uh, you know, I, I could probably spend, you know, another 15, 20 minutes telling, you know, lawyers behaving badly stories, but, um, it, you know, there was um, a trip with a client. Uh, we were, we were wooing a, a big corporate client. Uh, it was February. And, you know, the, the client was, you know, we were walking from, uh, you know, the you know, Fortune 100 headquarters to the bar and then to, you know, sort of the, the bar crawl. Um, and it, it was a full day. And I was, you know, I was there and my feet were really, really not cooperating. And, you know, there were other people with me and the client, you know, it was a group, and I was not able to keep up. That they were you were walking from the office to the bar to the restaurant, and I I literally could not keep up. And you know the you know the you know hey we're hey hey dude we're on a schedule here keep up you know keep up and it's like no we don't want to call a cab come on let's let's you know, it's 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 just a few blocks away let, let let's go there, and. You know, I you know I am not proud of myself for not standing up for myself, um, you know, or or saying I need to take a cap, or I, I I need to stop this because I am my feet are bleeding, <laughs> that that I feel my feet bleeding here in February in these dress shoes I cannot walk, um, and and that's. You know that that's something that I should have spoken up about, and you know I, I think me of of 2020 would definitely have have a lot 
uh, to say about that to me of, you know, 2008. <laughs> um, okay, so for a lot of reasons, some of which, you know, you can Google me and, and uh, read, read the happy fun slander. Um, I left um, the law firm in Richmond, Virginia that, that hired me in 2008, um, where I was a partner. And I moved into government service uh, in 2011. Uh, I worked at, at the National Labor Relations Board. And, you know, perhaps being in government um, or, or having more life experience or, or more self-awareness in 2011, I had a few different conversations. Uh, I, you know, I had met my new boss day one um, and said, yes, I, I have a disability. It's like, okay, Rachel, what do you need? I was like, well, you know, I don't think I need much, but I, I you know, have problems with grip. Uh, I have problems in the winter with mobility. Uh, and, you know, you know, if something comes up, I will make sure that we talk about it. Um, and it, it really didn't come up at all. And, and that was, that was totally fine. Um, in 2017, <laughs> uh, the week before, uh, the presidential inauguration, uh, for reasons, uh, I, uh, accepted a job with the EEOC and, you know, the, the, uh, U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, um, among other things, among many other things, the, the EEOC enforces our, our civil rights laws in the workplace, including the Americans with Disabilities Act, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability. So being an EEOC employee, there's, there's very much a cultural um, impetus, uh, a cultural imperative for, for us to get it right. <laughs> um, and you know one of one of the things that you know I I did at the EEOC was you know I, I had you know very specific conversations about my disability and and accommodations and you know culturally that's all banked in <laughs> um, and and so you know my my level of comfort on that I, I actually. Uh, you know, for the first time in my 20 year professional career, um, I did ask for an accommodation and, and let's do the show and tell. So uh, I'm, you know, we have, I was showing off my, my kit, uh, the, you know, the giant ring light and, and some other things to Denise. Um, with, with the pandemic, our, our, we've started testing and deploying AV kits, you know, a nice camera, microphone, ring light, and a tripod um, to, to our presidential appointees because they're doing a lot of public speaking via, via Zoom, via, via, you know, and via video conference. And so I'm one of the people deciding what we should buy um, and, you know, helping my boss, you know, the agency head with, with using um, some of this stuff. So the tripod that we got, I, I couldn't use, I, I could not open that darn tripod. And uh, it's like, guys, this isn't working for me. This this really isn't working for me. And and so this is this is my accommodation. You know, let's let's do it right on the camera. This is my accommodation. This is a thirty dollar Amazon. You know, and I, yeah, heck, I can name make, make, name the brand Amazon Basics. And you just flip that up there, and it, look 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 how look how easy that that does there. You know, flip and and there. And so you know, and it, and it's pretty sturdy. For, it's sturdier than a thirty buck tripod. Um, has any right to be. So, so that's my accommodation. It's like, guys, I can't, the, the very expensive and fancy tripod we have bought for everyone, I, I can't use, but this $30 tripod would work great. How about it? It's like, oh, heck yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it, it, it was, it was a non-issue. It was, it was a non-issue that, you know, of course, you know, we could do that. And, you know, one of the, one of the challenges of the pandemic uh, and, you know, being 
you know, he, okay, look, you know, I, I could get my unaffected kid to help me screw in the webcam here when it fell off the mount. And, you know, Denise saw that at about, you know, 7.58 uh, p.m. Eastern here. Um, you know, hey, kid, <laughs> help me screw this in. Um, but, you know, we, we, you know, in the workplace, you know, I, I can't call facilities to help me with my tripod. I can't call a tech because there ain't no one in there. Well, there are people in the office for, for other reasons, but you know, it's not like I have someone who, who can do it. So, you know, my, my, my first disability accommodation request and it went fine. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, embarrassed to say I, I did waffle a bit about it because it's like, oh, you know, maybe, maybe if I, you know, take a gripper or some pliers or something, I can make this tripod work. It's like, wait a second, wait a second, this is, you, stop. Okay, um, other things to come clean about or other things um, to maybe be overly candid about how some hiring works. Um, my first job at the EEOC uh, was was the product of knowing a lot of people and and buttoning buttonholing the agency head uh, at a conference. They they very much um, created a job that very much uh, tracked what I was doing at my previous agency. It, it was literally, Rachel, we want to talk to you about what you've been doing for the past you know, five, six years at the board and maybe help us figure out how we can do the same thing at the commission. And at the end of this conversation, it's like, well, Rachel, you wouldn't happen to know anyone who would want to do that at the commission, would you? And and it's like, oh. So, um, you know, for a lot of reasons, they, they needed, they realized or, or they had a desire to hire me uh, in a hurry, uh, right? before uh, the administrations changed in 2017. Um, one of the things about federal government hiring uh, is that it's, you know, it's often a, a competitive process. By the way, I'm, I'm creaming up my hands here because my hands are a little dry and I might as well do it while I'm on the call because why not? Um, so, you know, I, I have the bottle right there by my desk. Uh, so with federal government hiring, you know, you, you, there's all these rules about how long um, you have to keep a position open. Uh, and there's certain competitive rules on there that give preferences to veterans and, and, and especially disabled veterans. So as someone who's done hiring uh, in the federal government, there, there have been candidate panels um, that HR gives me where the only candidates that I get to review uh, are, are veterans. Uh, and if there's a disabled veteran on that candidate list, I, I have to write you know, you have to write a memo explaining to HR why the disabled veteran uh, is not, you know, you know shouldn't be hired. Um, I, I don't think I've said anything that'll get me in trouble there. That's all, that's all very factual. Um, there's a thing in the federal government on hiring authority called Schedule A Hiring Authority, um, which allows an agency uh, to hire a qualified person with a disability via Schedule A authority. Um, that doesn't go through the competitive process that lets you short circuit some of the process uh, associated with, with the, the competitive or the accepted service. So I'm a Schedule A hire. Uh, I'm a Schedule A hire at the EEOC uh, at, you know, the, at a very high level that it's like, guys, I'm a person with a disability and I can get a Schedule A certification. Um, and is that anything to be ashamed of? No, I don't, I absolutely don't think it is. Uh, Congress in its wisdom um, created Schedule A hiring authority to enable the federal government to make it easier, to make it easier for agencies like mine to hire people with disabilities. And as a federal government hiring manager, I have used Schedule A as someone, uh, as a manager in the federal government. I am uh, not just a hiring man. As a manager in the federal government, I have used Schedule A uh, to hire people with disabilities um, that you know have been have been identified. So it's a very powerful tool. Um, you know, by all means, if you don't know about it, and I think a lot of people outside the government don't know about it, um, make sure that's in in your vocabulary or your 
toolbox or that you 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 look it up or you put a pin in it to um think more about it okay we we've I, I think Denise and I touched on this in, in some of our back and forth. I, I want to like acknowledge my privilege and, and sort of you know the position that I'm in here. Um, okay, look, I'm I'm an executive at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. I'm saying yes, I'm comfortable coming out as a person with a disability. Uh, if it ain't okay, if it ain't safe for me to come out as a person with a disability at the EEOC, there's something horribly wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that in, in many uh, interactions, uh, you know, folks don't, my, my skin isn't that severe. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't want to minimize, you know, what I have, but, you know, just interacting with me from a, you know, from a distance, as long as you're not shaking my hand, or even if you do shake my hand, it's like, you know, do, does the disability, does, you know, do all of these issues immediately, you know, jump out at you? And, and so, you know, perhaps people don't regard me as, a, you know, having a, you know, ha having a disability or, you know, it, it's, it's a less visible disability. Um, and the other, you know, the other reality is, you know, a lot of my stories about how miserable I am in winter and I'm, I'm, you know, that's a real problem for me in winter. And when it's not winter, I'm, I'm much better. You know, the other thing is, at, you know, it, at this point in my life um, and, you know, many years in, into, you know, being on Accutane, isotretinoin, I'm pretty well dialed in on what I need to be comfortable, what I need to have my skin looking and feeling the way I want it to be. And, and so that, you know, that, that helps me um, in, you know, in, in a whole bunch of ways. Um, so, you know, I, I've, I've mentioned the tripod as an accommodation. Um, I've, I've also, you know, sort of had, had some travel related, uh, you know, hey guys, before you do this, let's talk. And, you know, in, in my, in my current job, you know, we were, <laughs> we we're so naive. Uh, oh my gosh. In, in February of this year, in February of this year, we were like planning these massive road trips across, you know, m with my boss and her staff around the country, visiting, you know, all of our offices. It's like, yeah, you know, I just don't want to go to Phoenix. <laughs> I, I, I just don't want to go to Phoenix. I mean, I love the people in our Phoenix office. Most, I'm not going to snark. I, I love the people in our Phoenix office. I would love to see them, but I just hate going to Phoenix. It's bad for my skin. Can I go somewhere else? Give, give, give that to someone else. It's like, yeah, sure. Um, and, you know, my hatred of the, you know, look, the last time I was in Phoenix, I left the office, I went to like the fast food joint across the street, I tried opening the door and I literally burned my hand on the door frame because, you know, it was like 115, uh, you know, and the metal heated up pad. I, I don't want to deal with that. Um, but, you know, in, you know, the reality of my, my career uh, is that I've, I've been a bit of a road warrior. Uh, when I was, uh, you know, in the private sector, I, I had matters across the country and did a lot of travel there um and you know in the government you know both uh both at the the national labor relations board and at the commission uh you know it, it's really a national role um and so you know running a nationwide enforcement program you know at both agencies it, it every now and then requires you to to show up in places uh sometimes for court sometimes for other things and uh, i've actually done multiple road shows where you know i've made an effort or or had imperatives to conduct training in every one of our offices. So, you know, the, the multiple road trips and just sort of stringing them together and spending weeks on the road um, has been a part of my professional career. Um, and you, gosh, I miss travel. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I, I, I do miss it. And, and, you know, these, these past several months, it's been a, a really strange experience, not jumping on a plane every now and then. Uh, hey, <laughs> um, so let's talk about me and traveling um, and, and my packing stuff. So uh, the reality is with a few exceptions, I always check a bag. 
because uh, you know it's like I, 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 you know, this is more than three ounces. I need, I need, you know, three ounces will last me maybe a day, maybe a day. And even if it, even if it's a day trip, I don't, I don't trust it only lasting a day. And so it's easier for me to check a bag. And the nice thing about you know being you know mumble mumble platinum is I don't pay the check bag fees. But the exception, the exception to always packing a bag and having my own toiletries is when I'm going to certain places that I know well, where I happen to know there's a CVS or a Walgreens around the corner or within striking distance of my rental car, I don't have to check a bag and I can just say, you know, I'm gonna walk on, I'm gonna buy a bottle of cream at CVS um, and then I'll just pitch it. Uh, before getting on the plane again. Not exactly proud of how wasteful that is, but sometimes sometimes uh, that's helpful. The other thing um, for the extended road trips um, where you know I'm on the road for, for quite a while, because you know because of my skin, wearing the same outfit multiple times doesn't work as well. Um, so laundry is is a consideration and understanding that there are some hotels um, that have coin operated laundry and sort of you know arranging my travel so that you know there's on day five or six I'm going to stay in a hotel where I can do a load of laundry that that's been uh, you know something I've had to think about um, I always travel with with my own soap and shampoo uh, I generally don't use hotel soap because it, it's it, you know I I know which ones are good for me and I know which ones are bad for me, so you know there's yeah, there's there's some hotels where I, I'm highly confident I know where I'm staying and it's okay that I can you know I can get away with that. There is you know there's a few you know products you know conditioner that like I I hoard the hotel conditioner that I really like that that has you know some nice memories for me and you know that you know that is. Um, you know that is what it is. Um, the you know the other thing you know that I'm sure a lot of us have you know you know tips and tricks you know in a hotel room. You know, because of my you know because you know, well because of my skin I don't have grip I don't have a really good grip, and and so you know just grabbing a hotel towel and using the towel to help increase my grip um, is is one of uh, the many things that that helps. But you know usually the towel ain't enough. So every trip, literally, literally every trip that I take, this thing is going in my bag. Uh, you know the uh, uh, this way. Yeah, jar, you know, the jar opener, it's, it's, it's heavier. I mean, you know, like uh, for a day trip, I wind up, you know, throwing a lot of stuff in my bag, but you know, this, this lives in my travel bag. Um, the jar opener just lives in my travel bag. Pair of pliers, pair of pliers. I travel with the pair of pliers because you know that if I get like a salad container, Okay, I, I learned, my secretary trained me, I can't ask my secretary to, to open my salad container for me, so I'm going to use a pair of pliers to open the, to open the salad container when it's, you know, hermetically sealed. Um, okay, so I use, you know, COVID, it, uh, it has sort of made me, you know, reconsider what my everyday carry can be. Um, I have the full pair of scissors in my travel kit now because heck I ain't getting on a plane so I can you know I can do that um I'm still traveling by the way I I gave so I live in Richmond Virginia I I gave up my apartment in Washington DC uh because I was sheltering in place in Richmond Virginia uh, but now that I gave up my apartment uh when I have to go into the office in the district uh, I'm just driving up there, staying in a hotel, and I, I had 15 nights uh, in October in a hotel, um, and I'm sp I spent a heck of a lot less on the hotels than I spent on an apartment, so I'm doing okay. And you know, I think there the, the hotel I was in, their occupancy rate was five percent, uh, so they treat you pretty darn well. Um, so that's nice. But so I, I, I just keep the scissors and and I actually have the Swiss Army knife. I I I now, you know, carry the blade. And of course that wouldn't work that wouldn't work on the airplane. So back when I didn't have the the scissors or the uh the, the cameras, it's backwards, but you know the scissors or the Swiss Army knife. Um, 
the trick, the trick that I used are the cuticle nippers. Okay, so the scissors to cut something open is the tool of choice because scissors work well. Cuticle nippers make it past TSA. I use them as cuticle nippers, but I also use them to cut things open because the little, the tiny little blade thing is sharp enough to cut things open when I'm by myself and I need to figure out how to open the darn salad container and I don't have my pliers with me. Yes, salad containers in me is a thing. Okay, um, more show and tell. Uh, yeah, the, the, this will show, this, this, this is probably the, hey, this isn't for the kids anymore. This thing is awesome. This thing, uh, it, you know, traveling um, with the automatic corkscrew, and and so it, you know, me and and the and the bottle of wine and the corkscrew, not so great. But you know, just tossing this thing in my bag, um, not that you know, it, not that heavy. A um, really little one. Can I ask what brand it is? Uh, yeah, I forget. It, it it it's it's I thought it's pretty heavy. <laughs> It it has it has some it has some weight to it because you know it's it's all just the mechanical corkscrew. Um, I'll, I'll 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 send you the the uh, Amazon link and you know make sure that everyone's signed you know <laughs> I'll send you the Amazon link. Um, okay, really really not you know for the kids, um, but I, I found I found a hip flask that's easy open. That oh, okay, it's also sparkly. Um, which is which is you know hilarious, um, but the last flask that I had for a while, you know, it was it was a bear to open. I was actually using the pliers to open the flask on the road, which which doesn't you know do well for it. But I, I got like the sparkly one uh, that with that's actually quite easy to open. Or for or for bonus points, you just use the towel to to open it um, for for real ease of use there. Um, that, that's that's my travel show and tell. I'm I'm sure other folks have have other other things that they travel with, but um you know the other thing, oops, um with everyday carry is, is that I do have the three ounce cream that is is always with me. Uh, it's it fits in, <laughs> you know it fits in the purse. Uh, there's multiple ones of them in the car, but by, by the way, not not only do I have one of these in my in my travel bag, but there's one in my car, and there's one in my desk, and there's one around the kitchen. And, you know, so you know, it's it's just having having you know these gadgets you know around, or it's not even a gadget; it's it's just a jar opener. Um, what are you opening? Uh, Water bottles, soda bottles, uh, you know, anything that that requires that 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 torquing effort, um, you know. But but yeah, you know, in the kitchen jars, in the kitchen actual pickle jars. I'm imagining uh, you like eating a lot of pickles. Pickles at work. <laughs> uh, yeah. Water bottle makes more sense. <laughs> yeah. What 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 water bottles and soda, what water water yeah. bottles and soda. Um, that's such a good idea. It, it, it's brilliant. well, you know, I, you know, sitting sitting in my car, not being able to open it, not being able to have a drink of soda, <laughs> you know, because yeah. I can't open it. Is like okay, right. I can solve this problem. Um, hey, by the way, the the other thing that's not exactly skin related, but um, it sort of is. Uh, I'm a fountain pen user, and I I very much enjoy um, being. Uh, the techie person, the person do it, talking a lot about the power of technology, and using a fountain pen, um, and you know that 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 it's on brand in a lot of ways, but it's also easier to write with. It's it's less pressure on you know the ballpoints can can be you know it, you know uh, several hours of note tanking on there. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a fountain pen fan and, you know, not just because of the skin, but it, it does help there. Okay. Um, not just while traveling, but um, other, other considerations that I, I wanted to talk about. Um, I shower in the morning all the time 
and um, back when I we had events in person, um, I would generally take another shower in the evening before an event. And um, actually using the office gym shower with, and realizing I could use the office gym shower was sort of life changing for me. Um, it, you know, I, I was really having trouble making things work when I was 30 to 40 minutes out. Um, and, you know, that's helpful. I've had trouble on the road um, that, you know, when, you know, in court or at conferences or, you know, especially at conferences, um, I'm much more comfortable saying no now, um, saying, you know, look, the day's over. I need time for myself to take a shower, to, you know, to deal with my skin before I meet you for dinner. So, no, I cannot make this early dinner. I will meet up with you later on. If you want to do an early dinner, I'll meet you at the bar later. I'll meet you at a restaurant later, but I need some time here. Um, and, you know, the other, you know, the other reality is um, Phoenix, right? It, that if we're in Phoenix, it, you know, I'm going to need some more time than when we're in Miami. Uh, you know, that, that those Vegas conferences kill me. I hate Vegas. I hate the desert. And it's like, if we're going to go to Vegas, okay, fine. But I'm going to need some time in the evening. Uh, and and that, that's just, you know, a matter of me being comfortable saying that and no longer having that fear of missing out. And it took me a while to get there. It, it, was, it was really, I wasn't comfortable doing that at the start of my career. I just wasn't, and, and now I am. And uh, I'm, you know, happy with that. Uh, my, you know, my other reality is, is that, um, A, I'm on retinoids, I, I'm on, you know, isotretinoin, I've, I've really dialed in on the dosage. And, and so, you know, my mobility now, um, especially in the winter when I put myself on the higher doses or when I say, hey, there's something I you know, want to be more mobile for, um, it's, it's good. And, you know, with the dosage, you know, look, I, I mess around with my dosage all the time <laughs> uh, that I'm, I'm literally going between 30 and 70 milligrams a day, depending on where I want to be. Um, and, you know, that's that, that, that may not quite be per spec on anything. Um, but, you know, fortunately, my, my Derm and I, you know, are, you know, her, her saving to the nurses, yeah, give her what she wants. She knows what she's doing. Uh, so, you know, I, buyer beware. Okay, um, lawyer stuff. Let's, you know, 15, 20 minutes on, on lawyer stuff before uh, all of your questions here or, you know, the expressions of outrage at, at the uh, happy fun slander I've said here. Um, I cannot give individual legal advice. Um, so if you're asking questions about how the law applies to you, I cannot answer that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk generally about non-discrimination and the Americans with Disability Act uh, and talk about some general legal concepts. Okay? So I, I can't give individual legal advice. Not this is you are not my client. I'm not authorized to take on any personal clients. I, I also really can't talk about what the commission can or will or would do with uh, anything that you might bring before um, someone from the commission. Okay, under the Americans with Disability Act, a disability, you know, the definition of disability talks about, hey, there's something about a major life activity. Because of my skin, do I have a harder time with major life activities? I don't know, major life activities like um, opening a water bottle, walking, <laughs> yeah, so I am a person with a disability. I mean, the, the legal standard is, hey, I think we're all there, okay? So under the law, it is unlawful under the Americans with Disability Act to discriminate on the basis of disability. And so, you know, if you're not hired because of your disability, if you're, if you don't get a reasonable accommodation because of your disability, that, that is a violation uh, of the law. And, and that's, you know, something that employers are, I think, are highly uh, responsive to. Uh, I think most employers do want to get it right. Okay, so I talked about my tripod. I talked about reasonable accommodations. One, one of the things that I think you know, we, we have to acknowledge or that we have to level set here is that, 
you have to be qualified to perform the job. You have to be qualified to perform the essential functions of the job. And, you, you know, but if you're qualified, when, you know, you're a qualified person, you say, hey, because of my disability, I need an accommodation. And this would be, guys, it's a $30 tripod. Just give me the $30 tripod. Really, it'll, it'll be fine. Um, give me a place to store my creams. You know, that, hey, you're only giving me this tiny little locker. That doesn't work for me. I, I need some place to store my creams. I need some place, you know, to store my adaptive equipment. Th those are, you know, those are all, you know, things that are, are uh, I think are, are very likely to be reasonable accommodations under the ADA. Um, in the context of schools, one thing that my kid, you know, encountered is my kid got locked in the bathroom <laughs> um, because the bathroom was a was a knobby thing and her hand kept on sliding off of, she didn't have enough grip to open the bathroom door. And, you know, the minute we said, and she got locked in the bathroom because of her disability. Like, oh my God, we'll, we'll fix that tomorrow. And they put in a lever lock. Okay, now swapping out a little knobby thing for a lever lock, that's pretty reasonable, guys. So, you know, th those, are, those are some things um, to think about. Okay, um, one of the important concepts within Title VII um, is Title VII prohibits discrimination on the basis of perceived disability, okay? So if you're at work and your boss says to you, well, I'm not gonna give you this job assignment because I don't think you'd want to do it because of your skin, or I don't think you can do it because of your skin, or, or you know, let's, let, let's, do an example about me, right? It's like, Rachel, I'm not gonna, you know, have you manage this thing out of Phoenix because you've talked about how miserable it is for you to go to Phoenix and you've expressed a strong preference that you don't like traveling to Phoenix because of your skin. Okay, well, well, taking that opportunity away from me, that is not great. And that's something that an employer, you know, they, they can only do, now, if there are other reasons to not send me to Phoenix, if there are other reasons to not give me that opportunity to manage this stuff in Phoenix, there, you know, there, there might be something going on there. But if it's because of the perception that I can't do it because of my skin or I won't do it because of my skin, that's something we have, we have to be careful about. So you know, I think you know, there's always, you know, hey, I wanna have you know, the, as, as you know, someone saying, people with ichthyosis, we want to do all this stuff. Yes, well, I want to be able to do all this stuff. I also want to answer the accommodations and, you know, where, you know, where things get tricky is when people start making assumptions about what you can and can't do. Um, the, the other thing that, you know, I, I think in, in the context of a hostile work environment, we, you know, we, we hear about you know, hostile work environment claims um, a, a lot in, uh, you know, in the context of Me Too, you know, a, a lot in the context of sexual harassment or, you know, harassment because of your sex, right? Um, discrimination on the basis of disability can also form the basis of a hostile work environment claim. So you can, you know, under our anti-discrimination laws, it's not just sex that's you know, sex and race, that's, that, that can be the basis of a hostile work environment. Um, you know, religion, disability, uh, it, genetic information um, can all form the basis of, of a hostile work environment claim. So, you know, some of the real challenging things for the lawyers um, are, are when there are bad incidents in the workplace that don't get reported to management or HR. That one of the things about hostile work environment claims is that it has to be persistent and unwelcome. Now, some things can be so bad that a single instance is enough to support a hostile work environment claim, okay? That in the context uh, of race discrimination, courts, courts have talked about, you know, use of the N-word, okay? That, that use of the N-word, uh, you you can you can have 
you know, very limited use of the N-word that creates a hostile work environment very easily for, I think, entirely understandable reasons. Um, you know, that multiple judges have said that, right? Um, but, you know, for, for things like people talking about skin and talking, you know, talking about the things that, that come with our skin, uh, persistent and unwelcome. That, that, you know, a, a judge, you know, a court is going to have to find persistent, you know, that it's persistent and unwelcome and that management didn't act on it promptly if it's, you know, unless it's done by a manager. So, you know, I, I think talking to HR, talking to management promptly uh, and, and saying, hey, this isn't cool. This, 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 is, this is not okay. Please do something about it. And and documenting your claim, uh, I think those are the kind of things that that um, form the basis uh, of uh, of a lot of the you know well people who don't do that uh, can often find themselves in you know having trouble proving their case in court. Um, okay, uh, my my further disclaimers: um, if you feel that you face discrimination in the workplace um, because of your skin, please talk to a lawyer who's not me. <laughs> um, you know, I think many, many lawyers handling discrimination claims, um, they, they do uh, have free consultations and, you know, finding a, a lawyer who, who understands the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, um, and, you know, can, can help, you know, advise you about your particular circumstances. Uh, that, that's something that uh, I think uh, is better in an individualized session than anything you can get from me with all of my disclaimers. Okay, um, that was a lot of monologuing. Denise, uh, have I, do we have anyone still on the line? We do, we've got okay. lots of people on the okay. line still. Want to I'm tee trying, up a few questions? I'm trying to scroll through here. Um, a lot of people identifying with the grip issues. Uh, definitely something. Um, I know I've got grip issues as well. I think um, one of the things I was I was wondering. Uh, grip is so related to other things. For me, my grip issues. I think actually connected to developing carpal tunnel. Um, because I, I wasn't gripping things properly. And then I was like, uh, holding weight improperly. And so then being out of alignment created other issues. And so now I have really bad carpal tunnel. So I, I think that you're right to say that using adaptive equipment is, um, is important because if you just sort of like hobble along and I mean, the more we try to cover up the ways that we can't hack it. I mean, you can sort of never, like, I don't know. It, you can you can try to to cover it up, but you're only you can only get so far fooling yourself, and then yeah. <laughs> before I, it catches up to you, you know. And in my case, it's like I was I was doing yoga wrong for a long, long time, and even though I was doing something healthy, yoga, because my grip was wrong, and in ichthyosis, like I can't properly flatten my hands all the way. And I know for you in, in our, our case, you and I have been in meetings before and like, we can't flatten our hands completely. So if you can't flatten your hands completely, you can't do yoga properly. If you can't do yoga properly, then you're going to like it, one thing leads to another, to another, to another. And yeah, so it's, it's maladaptive. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, so with, the bullet, with my own, yeah, with my own fingers, I, I have, I have, you know, my, my fingers are bent. Um, and, and that's not because of carpal tunnel, that, that's because of, of banding that I, I had a whole bunch of skin on, you know, banding around, around my fingers there that, that pulls it out of alignment. And so I, I may, I'm sort of able, uh, left versus right, I'm sort of able to, to open, to straighten up my hands. This is about as straight as they get. Um, and, and so there's, there's that deviation right. over there. I took a shower from like, you know, seven to seven thirty uh, you know, tonight cause you know, I wanted to feel comfortable. So, you know, this is really right. as flexible as, as my hands get and you, you see that right. bend there. Um, you know, the, the other thing to remember is that, you know, just like unaffected people falls with ichthyosis, you know, we, we, you know, ergonomics are important, you know, to, to us too. So, you know, I have, I have the wrist rest 
for you know my keyboard that I'm in front of all day now and you know this this isn't this has nothing to do with my skin this this is you know my carpal tunnel you know and and sort of that pain the wrist rest you know is for that you know, right. I, I did, you know, I mounted a screen, you know, in my, in my home office here. So I'm not, you know, bending down on my neck. And so, you know, now I'm looking, looking up and, and, you know, that, that helps me there. I have a standing desk in my office and, you know, the standing desk is, is great for my back and, you know, that pain and not have, you know, that, you know, Hey, give me a standing desk that has nothing to do with my skin. Nothing. Right. Right. I guess I would just, I, I would add overall that um, I, I thank you for, for going through all of the adaptations that you share because um, there's so much, there's so much about having ichthyosis that's, that's difficult mentally and emotionally and then physically. And so I think sometimes we just sort of slog through it and we're busy adults. I mean, you're traveling so much, you've got family, you've got kids, you've got a huge career. And so it, you know, we don't want people to pity us. So that might be why we don't bring it up to the employer. We don't want to become known as the girl with the weird skin. And so we don't make it the the thing that we lead with when we're young or even when we're middle-aged or even when we're older. It's not what we want to be our signature. We want to become known for, for the other things about us. And so um, I remember it, last year I was shopping for boots and I, I was like, my, my feet were bleeding because I was, I was in the North and it, it was winter. And I was like, why am I doing this? Like yeah. I, I'm, my feet are cracked. And I didn't even realize that, that that's like, it, it's just, you know, we go about our lives and as adults, we've had ichthyosis since we were born. And so we forget about it and we bury it. And I guess I just, I mean, I, I encourage everybody in the ichthyosis community to just deal with their ichthyosis in whatever way is comfortable for them um, and to try to reduce the shame and to just note these things about your body without judgment, but just with neutral, neutral observation and to surround yourself with people that can help you understand that and to just say, oh, okay. All right. Well, would you, would you like chapstick right now? Would you, would you like me to heat up your lotion for you? Would you like to try a different lotion? Uh, and to, to look at your, your lotion carrier, all of the things that you do to care for your body is just part of just being a healthy human being, the way that we look at getting the proper amount of sleep. It's an ideal that we strive for. And it's just another thing that we do, even if having skin pile up on the floor or having strangers look at you weird on the airplane is, is uncomfortable. It's just, it's, it's unfortunately, you know, our, our everyday life. And so, you know, embrace it. Um, but thank you for, for taking us through all of those things, because a lot of it, again, it just, it makes life easier if you don't fight it, because who are we actually convincing if we're, if we're just going to gnaw through our salad container? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, it doesn't I serve think, anybody. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I certainly have a, a lot of, you know, intersecting identities and, you know, these, these identities are, are part of who I am. They, they are absolutely part of who I am, you know, what, what made me, what, what makes me tick, what perspective I have on the world. Um, and also, I'm more than my identities that, you know, I, I'm, I'm more than a person with a disability. I, I'm, I'm more than someone who needs this stuff. I'm, I'm right. someone, I'm also someone who contributes to the mission, uh, who helps other folks yeah. on mission. And, you know, that, that has nothing to do with my skin and my disability. Now, you know, now certainly my perspective of being someone with a disability doing the work that I do, it helps me that, that right. perspective helps me and you know is, is it you know is it is it the same as you know this you know does it really help me when when dealing with the ASL interpreters or <laughs> well maybe not but you know there, there's their shared perspective of sorts right right well let's get to some questions here yeah yeah um, I don't want to hog you because I I certainly could talk your off all night um let's see uh the first question that jumps out at me and anyone with questions please leave them in the chat and we'll try to um to be respectful of rachel's time here and get through uh questions 
Lowell Wright says, in your opinion, when reporting an incident, is it better to report to a member of management or HR personnel? Is there a difference between the two? Um, you know, I think in, in large organizations, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, both, <laughs> cover yourself with both. Um, I, you know, I think in large, or, you know, I think where the, the problems that I've I've personally observed is when the manager uh, is the one saying the problematic things or creating, you know, creating problems for you. And so, you know, ideally, there are reporting chains, there are th chains through HR, uh, or otherwise that that let you raise those concerns. Th this can be really problematic or, or really challenging in smaller organizations and entities. And, and so, you know, yeah, you know, the, the large, the large companies generally have these formalized reporting processes that I would encourage you to take advantage of. Thank you. Let's see. Um, Christina Raj from India is sharing a story sounds like she was made to, um, I'm just trying to skim here. Um, I apologize. Uh, it sounds like in India, um, there's problems recognizing ichthyosis as a disability. Um, do you know, I know that your, your work has been limited um, to uh, the, the National Labor Relations Board here and then the EEOC here, but what's your, what's your experience been with um, disabilities uh, and the way that ichthyosis has been recognized by other countries as a disability? Uh, I, I am not an expert on international law or international disability law. And, uh, I, you know, I would refer that question to some uh, learned colleagues uh, who, who specialize, uh, who focus on that, on that. Uh, I don't know, Denise. <laughs> I, I stumped you. You did. Right away. Right away. Out of my league. <laughs> okay. Um, it sounds like she was made to sit uh, right under the AC vent, which um, can, can be- uh, Can also be problematic, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. not too cold. It's like, yeah, what do you want? Tell us what you want. Yeah. I can only imagine. Um, yeah. I think that you mentioned earlier um, something about discrimination on the basis of genetic information. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell me a little bit, can you say more about that? Gina, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, yes. Gina was passed um, uh, quite a bit ago uh, that makes it uh, unlawful to discriminate uh, on the basis of genetic information. Um, so, you know, there, oh gosh, uh, yeah, yeah, hot button issues of the law. Um, so, you know, this, it, you know, Congress's intent to the extent I could ever talk about Congress's intent, um, you know, was was to uh, prevent, you know, the movie Gattaca, if you remember, if you remember that, um, you know, where where your your gene tests and, and your genetic predisposition, theoretically, your genetic predisposition to having certain conditions um, would you know, cause your employers to not want to hire you or, you know, it's like, oh, wow, you know, you have the BRCA1 gene, so you're likely to have breast cancer, so we're just not going to assume you're going to be around for 20 years. That would be unlawful under GINA because it's, it's discrimination on the basis of genetic information. So just having certain genes doesn't qualify as a disability under the ADA unless it's the, we're talking about the expression of the genes, which, which then, you know, major life activity. GINA is solely on what the gene is um, or seeking to do it, uh, you know, in terms of genetic information. Now, uh, the intersection of GINA with employer wellness programs uh, is probably a regulatory guidance that will be published for public comment by the commission within the next very soon. So wellness guidance uh, will touch on, on, uh, on some of that. And that is way, way inside baseball in the regulatory agenda. But uh, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA, uh, go ahead and look that one up.
sounds like a, a nerd field, a field to watch <laughs> a field to keep an eye on uh the in terms of in terms of discrimination um here's a an interesting like i guess just hy hypothetical for you do you feel like do you feel like there's more problems for people with like highly visible discrimination um, or uh, like highly visible disabilities or the lesser visible ones? So like, um, like people in wheelchairs um, or people with like a, a more mild form of ichthyosis. So you said earlier that, you know, most people just from looking at you don't see that you have a disability. Um, who do you think faces more discrimination? Yeah, I, I think that the quantitative answer is is very difficult to to give. You know, certainly, you know, at the EEOC, we have access to all kinds of information about the charges that are filed, but our 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 issues and basis data uh, doesn't really distinguish between visible and invisible and and uh, you know or what what we colloquially call visible versus invisible uh, you know i think that you know part of the challenge is you know on my bad days you know where i i'm with a cane hobbling around that's very visible right um and on my good days i'm i'm not using my cane and and i'm getting around fine and you know what you know what you know what what does that mean right um you know there's i think there's a difference between the severity of our skin and the language that we use with visible and invisible okay that you know you know invisible you know, part of part of the challenge of you know many folks with disabilities not just ichthyosis is is getting people to understand that I have good days and bad days that on my good days, I'm fine. And on my bad days, hey, there, there's things that I, I, I need to take slow or I, I, I need to think, you know, we, I can't do or I need, I need some help doing. And that, well, you were fine yesterday or you didn't need help yesterday. That, that, that's a tough, you know, conversation. Um, you know, discrimination, there's, there's all different kinds of discrimination. Um, and you know, part of the managing expectations, and you know, having supportive workplaces, and you know, ha you know, having having coworkers and management that supports you as a person, and you know, you you know, with your health needs, while while also saying, well, there are essential functions, and let's make sure we have coverage, or there are there there where we have deadlines here. Let's let's change our staffing so so that you know that can um, you know that that can happen. It's not easy, as, you know. You know, I, I tell you, as as management, you know, uh, you know, working uh, with people who have disabilities and who have you know, just like the rest of us, uh, you know, family members who who get sick kids who you know kids who have problems with zoom class and and you know it's like okay they 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 need to work out you know child care stuff it is it is not easy you know look look you know woe is me as a manager okay but you know, it, it's all of us and and having a supportive environment um at work it's tough we're you know it's i think we're all feeling it i i, I really do I, I think that you're absolutely right. Um, the the 2020 version of this talk is no doubt different than the, the 2019 version. <laughs> Indeedy. What advice would you give for um, a young person um, who's who's just starting out their career? And um, I mean, we I think we talked kind of obliquely about what changes you and I might might have have made but specifically to a person with ichthyosis who's looking to get started in their career um, what to look out for and what to consider um, in looking for a supportive work environment uh, that might be more mindful um, for for their disability um, and uh, to, to try to how to I guess red flags to look for in a discrimination situation sure so 
my my first big picture point is if you have a good work environment, they're going to get not just disability, but all of the other stuff. I think I think they'll get it right too. That that there is a there you know at, in the good work groups that I've experienced the 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 you know it's it's not just one thing it's it, it it's the multitude of them um you know one one group that i you know that i can think of you know they were they were trying to get better on on you know one particular aspect um they they hired a consultant and the consultant went in and said oh my gosh you're you're so horrible to your women maybe you should maybe you should not be so sexist before you even Figure out how to work on some of this other stuff, and and that's uh, I'm I, I'm probably getting too far into the happy fun slander. Um, so in, in a large enough organization, you know, I, I would seek out informally. You know, LinkedIn is a great resource for this. Um, secondhand connections. You know, asking people. You know, that in informal interview scenarios, I think it's very difficult to get. A, a candid uh, answer about what it is to work, you know, at a place, and you know where where I think we sometimes get overly optimistic is when is when an institution has a bad reputation, and the people say, "Oh, never mind that reputation." This small group that we're with is really good, <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay, uh, yeah, but but institutionally, what does that mean for the culture? Um, you know, I, I I left a law firm ten years ago, and you know have have been a mentor to you know some some people at you know from that firm at that firm who who sought me out for for various reasons you know I, you know yes because i engaged in in happy fun slander it, you know in uh, you know in the media and and then you know the snarky stuff turned into you know some mentoring relationships um and you know having having people who who can mentor you and you know talk about what you're experiencing and you know say well you know is is that a good thing, you know, are you, you know, are you asking for too much? You know, is this reasonable? Um, you know, it, it's good to have mentors. It's, it's important to have mentors. Um, and actually answering your question, one of the things that I would say to me 20 years ago, um, I would ask, hey, friend, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid is going to happen? And you know, I think me of 20 years ago, I had a lot of fear within me. Uh, I, I had, I, I was confident in, in my own way, but I, I also had a lot of fear within me, um, you know, not just about my skin, but also, you know, about my skin and, you know, to a large, to a large degree. And I'm, I'm a very, <laughs> I'm a very different person now. Um, but my attitudes about my skin are also different. And, and I think that's, important and I wish me of 20 years ago had had come to those realizations sooner. Yeah, not letting fear make make my decisions for me, I think is, is where I would net out probably having this this uh, fear that that my skin would would become what I'm known for. And it's like, I mean, you're you're a pretty big personality as am I like, <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> I don't think we had anything to worry about, Rachel. <laughs> That's true. You didn't know me 20 years ago, though. So uh... <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, um, I, I think we're, we're out of time here. And um, I, we've had um, a, a group of people, man. We, we've had probably 15 people on for the, the entire time, which makes us um, quite, uh, makes me really happy to know that, that we've had a, a group I wish that um, maybe we maybe we should have done this on Zoom, but Facebook keeps changing platforms. Uh, but uh, so, thank you to to those of us, to those of you in our family and our ichthyosis community here that um, that have stayed with us uh, for the entire duration of this conversation. Uh, to to Tina and Lowell and Diana and Lisa 
Uh, I'm just scrolling through the comments here. Um, it's so good to see you all. It's like um, romper room. I see all. <laughs> <laughs> that <Yeah>. dates me <laughs> says thank you for sharing your knowledge travel tips and your experiences it is not always easy to reveal details about our lives but doing so gives others the ability to feel a sense of unity and hope yes indeed and um ideas you know ideas for to just um to just think about making those adaptations um it sounds so simple but really i mean the more we try to fit into a world that's made for people with normal skin, the more, um, the more it can feel like there's a weight on our shoulders. Um, Lowell's got uh, a letter to our ichthyosis community coming. Um, it's going to be in everybody's inboxes soon. And um, he talks about the weight that it feels to, to try to, to try to fit yourself into that, um, that mold and carrying around a jar opener is a really simple way to just say, you know, <laughs> no, I'm not, I don't have normal grip and that's okay. It's not my job. Um, it's not, you know, my, my hands don't, don't work that way and that's okay. Uh, but this other thing can. And so that's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not, uh, it's not my, my malfunction. It's the, the bottle's malfunction to not be made to, to, to a way that, that I can open it. So, um, thank you so much, Rachel. It's always good to, to see you and hear from you. Thank you for all that you've done for the ichthyosis community. You, um, you never, never cease to amaze me. And um, in these years of social distancing, uh, it's, it's really lovely to, to continue to interact with all of our members. So um, thank you for being a part of our Facebook groups and continuing to weigh in there and to always offer your um, your support and your experiences. You've, um, you've tried, you've tried it all and you always weigh in with advice <laughs> and thoughts for our parents. And, um, I know that that means so much to, to the community. So, um, thank you for, uh, for always being so giving of your time. I really, really value your sharing um, of your, of yourself. So generous. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's, it's great seeing everyone uh, virtually and uh, y'all know where to find me. I'm easy to find. So thank you. All right. Have a great night. Thank you everyone. Stay safe and happy holidays. Hanukkah's this week. Yay. All right. Bye.